is Dan Kilbride. I'm a history professor and head of the honors program at John Carroll University, where I've been since uh, 1997. Awesome. So uh, thank you for joining us. Um, today we're going to talk about your article, Cannibals, Gorillas, and the Struggle for Over Radical Reconstruction. Great. And maybe if you could just kind of give us an overview of what the article was, is, and uh, why you uh, wrote it. Yeah, so uh, the article stems from research that I've been doing for about five years on uh, how Americans in the 19th century um, engaged with Africa. And what I mean by engaged with is what they knew about Africa, what they thought they knew about Africa, uh, how they found out about that, where they got their information or their misinformation, and what they did with that information. And so this article really um, engages with the what they did with that information. Um, and so I've written a couple articles on this, um, on, on this theme. I wrote an article about Frederick Douglass, uh, about what what he thought about Africa, um, and so this is my first uh, my first foray really into Reconstruction. So you know, in, in American history, uh, Reconstruction typically dates from uh, 1863 in the middle of the Civil War until 1877. Um, although, depending on what state you lived in, Reconstruction would have ended probably well before 1877. And so Reconstruction was an extremely contentious era in American history. Uh, for some people, it still is. Uh, for a long time, Reconstruction was seen as uh, the victorious North, um, you know, vindictively uh, putting their boots on the necks of the defeated Confederacy. Um, that view has, has changed. Uh, very much so in the last 50 or so years. Uh, and so this is the, this is the latest uh, chronologically that I've ever done history. Typically I've, I've written about the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s. And so this is, this is pretty exciting for me. And um, it appeared in the journal Civil War History um, last year. And so what the article really talks about is um, so, you know, the, the, the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s uh, was an era of uh, uh, the really first intensive um, explorations of Africa by serious people, uh, people like David Livingston um, uh, uh, and, and, and a number of others, especially some, uh, a lot of missionaries um, who, you know, uh, of course, their views of Africans were what we are considered to be racist and ethnocentric. But, you know, these writers really, for the first time, really engaged with Africa and Africans in a serious and sympathetic way. And so what I talk about in the article is that, uh, you know, during Reconstruction, one of the very controversial uh, 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 movements was the grant, you know, not only the emancipation of roughly 4 million slaves um, with the 13th Amendment, but also the granting of citizenship uh, to African Americans by the 14th Amendment. And even arguably more radical was the granting of the suffrage to African American men with the 15th Amendment. And so what I argue in the article is, first of all, that um, the more sympathetic accounts of Africa and Africans that appeared in the 1850s, which really challenged um, the typical racist view of African peoples that they were simply intellectually and morally inferior to you know, Anglo-Saxons as they would, would have been called, uh, really, really, um, really uh, laid the foundation for uh, you know, Northern white people to really think about, well, maybe African-Americans really are capable and, and the deserving of citizenship. They can handle it. They can handle the responsibilities of the suffrage. They can handle the responsibilities of citizenship. And I think especially the, uh, you know, the book by David Livingston, uh, Missionary Travels and Researches, uh, which is a huge bestseller. Uh, I mean, an enormous bestseller in the United States and Great Britain, um, really I think laid the foundation for a new conception of African and Africans capabilities for uh, responsible citizenship. 
However, in the 1860s and 1870s, a new and much less sympathetic wave of African travel accounts um, appeared. Um, and these African travel accounts were typically these sort of dark Africa accounts that Africans were, you know, lots of descriptions of cannibalism and human sacrifice and, you know, and, and you know, outrageous religious practices, which contradicted some of the earlier notions of Africans. Uh, and very importantly, uh, a, a French American explorer named Paul de Chailloux um, was the first Westerner ever to see lowland gorillas in the wild. That is, you know, not not a not a skeleton, not a not a, not a cadaver, but an actual but actual gorillas in the wild. In his very again very lurid and very inaccurate accounts of the gorilla, gave ammunition to the opponents of radical reconstruction, of giving African-Americans the vote, giving them suffrage, uh, giving them citizenship. And so this link between, well, Africans and gorillas, right there, you know, cause gorillas are eerily similar to human beings in many ways. And so these, you know, these, these racist, largely democratic, uh, 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 both Northern and Southern opponents of reconstruction sort of took these books and weaponized them. Uh, to, to fight against citizenship, to fight against suffrage. Now, they, they lost that struggle, right? But in the long run, I argue that they kind of won in, in sort of dampening Northerners' um, enthusiasm for carrying Reconstruction to its end. Because as we know, but when Reconstruction ended in 1877, Northerners largely turned their attention away from Southern affairs. And, you know, in the next 30 years, we see white Southerners really reversing the progress that had been made during reconstruction with things like the Jim Crow laws. Uh, we have dis disenfranchisement with various um, tools like grandfather clauses and poll taxes and outright violence and intimidation. Uh, there of course is the rise of lynching uh, in the 1880s, 90s and, and going forward which sends a very you know, unambiguous message to Southern uh, African-Americans that is, no one is coming to help you. You are second-class citizens and you better not step out of your place because you know, the, Abraham Lincoln is not coming. Um, and uh, I think these new African travel accounts really, again, laid the foundation for a reversal of much of the progress that had been made during Reconstruction. Yeah, that's a, that's a great overview. And I think the, the thing that I was struck most by was the, uh, in reading it was these, you know, I think you do very well, this competing um, kind of narratives that come out of the travel narratives. So maybe if you could speak a little bit more about how the Livingston and the um, other prior to reconstruction um, kind of framed Africa positively. Yeah, so uh, I mean, we read these today and they seem to be very derogatory and very ethnocentric and very racist. But you have to read these in the context of the 1850s when universally across the Western world, the English speaking world, Africans and their descendants were almost universally viewed by again, Anglo-Saxons, white people as we would call them as inferior, degraded, um, and not worthy of respect. And so, you know, what Livingston, and these are largely um, uh, very devout Christians, people like you know, David Livingston and, and others. Uh, there's two Americans that I talk about, uh, John Leighton Wilson, who was a Presbyterian missionary, um, and Thomas Jefferson Bowen, who was a Southern Baptist missionary. Um, you know, these, these, these explorers certainly were committed to transforming Africa and embracing it into the, you know, the Western world. Um, they really had no sympathy for African cultures or African uh, religious practices, but they viewed Africans themselves as people who were fully capable of engaging with Christianity, of engaging with complex ideas. And so it wasn't so much that they had a, pro, a, a sympathetic account of African civilizations, but they had a sympathetic account of African people. 
and their capabilities. So they, they, they largely, you know, they, they didn't talk hardly at all about the typical narrative of Africa with human sacrifice, cannibalism. I cannot tell you how often that these tropes appear in earlier and later African travel accounts. But Livingston and others didn't talk about them. They said, these things are not happening. You know, they're not happening. Africans are not cannibals. Africans do not practice, you know, human sacrifice. You know, they're, they're, these people are not evil, murderous barbarians. They are people with the same feelings, the same sentiments, the same family commitments that we have in our civilization. So that account of Africans was really transformative and in, in really contradicting an earlier kind of consensus that Africans were barely human beings and, 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 and really embodied the worst aspects of humanity. So those earlier accounts, and especially Livingston, because who had enormous credibility, um, you know, these explorers had, I, I want to emphasize their credibility because exploring Africa was not easy. Uh, you know, it was, we're talking about disease and hardship and starvation and um, vulnerability to violence. Um, you know, mission, British and American missionaries who went to West Africa had a horrific mortality rate because they had, they had no, you know, uh, inborn immunity or, or acquired immunity to things like malaria or all these other diseases to which they, as adults, they were immediately um, uh, 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 exposed to. Uh, and, you know, they died very quickly in enormous numbers. And so John Layton Wilson and his, and his wife, Jane, were really the exceptions. They, they served in Africa for over 20 years. And they suffered, you know, they, they were sick frequently, but they somehow survived. I'm not sure how they did it. And there's a really wonderful book called By the Rivers of Water that uh, talks about uh, the, the, the Wilsons and their uh, commitment um, to Africa and, uh, and their marriage. It's a really wonderful book. Um, and so these accounts just really, really did a 180 on how Americans and British people um, who kind of you know, occupied the same kind of cultural uh, atmosphere, um, how they thought about Africa and Africans. Oh well, yeah, and, that, and I think it's important too because uh, putting it in context of what's happening in America at the time, we're um, we're moving into the Civil War, right? Yeah. What happened, and and there was this debate about whether or not um, slaves and black people could engage in civic life, and these travel narratives challenged that a little bit, right? And that's just a little bit. I mean, it didn't <laughs> it didn't solve the problem in any way, but sure. And you know, the uh, the eighteen fifties was a bad decade to be black in America. Um, there's a famous line by Abraham Lincoln when he was involved in the, uh, uh, the Senate debates with Stephen Douglas, where Douglas said, you know, uh, black people have never had it so good in America. And, and Lincoln was like, what are you talking about? You know, think about things like, you know, the, 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 the spread of slavery over the United States in the 1830s, 40s and 50s, the expansion of slavery, uh, the Dred Scott decision, which ruled that black people were not and never could be and never had been citizens. Um, I mean, the 1850s were grim. I mean, black people in America had been very resistant to the idea of you know, the so-called colonization movement, about going back to Africa. Um, but in the 1850s, some of them actually started thinking seriously about it because the, the prospects for a decent life in the United States looked as remote as they could be. So we know that the end of slavery is literally right around the corner, but nobody else knew that in the 1850s. It, slavery looked like it was had a bright future in the United States in the 1850s. And so it was a very grim decade for people of color. And it's interesting that people of color really are not all that interested in these travel accounts because they are very anxious that white Americans not see them as Africans, but see them as Americans. And so I, I mentioned earlier that I had written about Frederick Douglass and that was his thing to say that we can't afford, we as black people cannot afford to be seen being even interested in Africa because we need to emphasize that we are Americans and this is our country. Because if we don't do that, they're gonna send us to Africa. 
<laughs> so it's, inter it's an interesting juxtaposition that um, black people really don't have very much interest in these travel accounts, but white Americans have intense interest in them. I think um, one of the things that um, stuck out, and we're going to jump through the Civil War and kind of fast into Reconstruction, but this uh, French um, author you uh, mentioned, I'm going to murder his name. How did you say it? Uh, I think it's Chaillou, Paul de Chaillou. I'm yeah. not sure how to pronounce it. Out. Yeah, they don't know how to pronounce my name, either, so it, it all works out. Um, but the uh, his work really is transformed after the Civil War, right? Because he writes kind of a sympathetic book, but then in talking about it and on the circuit of promoting it, things kind of change and this white supremacy kind of takes over, but also a sensationalism, right? Yeah, I mean, his, his book and the way that it is sort of marketed and promoted are really complex. Because on the one hand, you know, he does, his accounts of Africans are very sympathetic. Like for example, he spends a lot of time with the so-called Fon people and he's in like central Africa. So he's in like the, uh, the area below Liberia, uh, north of South Africa. And uh, so he talks about the Fon people. On the one hand, he says they're shameless cannibals. They practice cannibalism and they're all about cannibalism. On the other hand, he says, they treated him with the greatest hospitality. That, you know, he, again, he was frequently ill in Africa with malaria and other um, problems. And he says that, they, that he was, you know, he was ministered to and treated and convalesced with the utmost kindness. And he says that, you know, if, if anybody in Africa is ready for civilization, it's these people. They're, they're smart, they're humane, um, they're, uh, they, they, they treat strangers with the utmost hospitality, uh, and yet, and yet they, they're shameless cannibals. So there is this really, um, this complex and, uh, sort of contradictory, uh, view in his books, but then you get to the way that he himself promoted these books. And he, as you said, he went on the lecture circuit. So these, his, again, his books, and he wrote a number of books, including children's books. Um, about Africa. And in his tours, he really dropped the sympathetic portrayal of Africans and really leaned hard into the Africans of practicing cannibalism. They're practicing human sacrifice. They have, you know, idolatrous, you know, they, you know, their religious practices, everybody just reduced them to sort of devil worship. And so that's what he really leaned into in his in his uh, in his uh, lectures, and I surmise, I kind of hypothesize in my article that he he really he took cues from his audience that this is what they wanted to hear. This is the stuff that they really came for to you know hear about cannibalism, to hear about sacrificing children, um, all these barbaric practices, and that's so he kind of said, all right, you know, th this is what my audiences want to hear. I'm going to give it to them. And that's what he really, really leaned into in his, and, and you know, my main sources for this article are newspapers um, and some magazine and journal articles, but largely newspapers. And you really see the, these accounts of his, you know, whenever he went into a city, there was an article about him and talked to me, you know, Paul Deshai is in town and here's what he said in his, in his, uh, his lecture last night. And it's very clear that, you know, they talk about applause lines and the audience responding to certain things. It's these accounts of these very lurid, very dark Africa accounts that really contradicted some of the earlier, more sympathetic ones. Right, and, and you also say that they probably weren't true, some of the lurid things that he... Right, um, yeah, like some of his accounts of gorillas simply do not, they're not consistent with what we know about gorillas. And the gorillas in the wild are very shy and very retiring. They're not aggressive. They're not violent. Um, and so you, know, you get some of these ridiculous, and not just Shayu, but other people as well, um, talk about you know, like gorillas hiding in trees and plucking women from the path and bringing them back to their lair. Uh, and you know, uh, and you know, Deshayu did things that we would consider pretty shocking, like just just, just shooting gorillas and you know, bringing back them, bringing them back as specimens and things like that. Um, 
But, you know, he, he said things about gorillas and presumably also about Africans that were just not true um, and were, were sensationalized, um, perhaps for, you know, the point of, you know, of selling books and getting people in the, into the seats where he was giving lectures. But especially the things he said about, about gorillas are just not consistent with what we know about how gorillas actually behave. Let's talk a little bit more about the, the gorilla because I think the, uh, you mentioned gorilla fever swept through uh, yeah. the press at this time, but it also, it seemed to me that like it, while it was an exotic kind of monster, it also ties into what was happening at the time where uh, our African Americans, black people, freed slaves, able to be, you know, be part of our society. Right. So it plays into this, right? Yeah, and it's also true that, you know, it's also important that at this time, um, the impact of uh, Charles Darwin's Origin of Species was beginning to be felt. I mean, that book was published in 1856, but, you know, it took a while for people to kind of grapple with what the implications of Darwin's argument about natural selection and evolution actually were. And so, you know, people began to kind of create almost like a, uh, a spectrum of humanity with the lower races, you know, down here and the higher races, of course, being all white Anglo-Saxon Protestant people up here. And then the gorilla is also on that timeline. And so the argument is like Africans are, maybe African people are closer to monkeys and gorillas than they are to white people. And so you begin to get, you know, Southern and Southern writers and sympathetic Northerners saying, you can't give the vote to gorillas. You can't, you know, gorillas are savage, violent beasts. And African Black people are one step, you know, you know they're not that far from gorillas. They're, they're closer to gorillas than they are to us. And we can't give them citizenship. We can't give them the right to vote because they, they can't handle it. They're, they're animals and they act like animals. They're savage and violent. They, they're all id. They can't, they don't know how to behave. They're uncivilized. And so, you know, these, 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 these articles, these politicians, um, and I quote, uh, you know, the, the French, um, the future, future French prime minister or president, George Clemenceau, who was actually a, a journalist in the United States during reconstruction, who was reporting on American affairs for France. And said that you know if you were a, if you were a Democrat, and you gave a speech in which you didn't accuse black people of being gorillas, people would have thought you lacked enthusiasm. Like everybody hammered on this theme, uh, who was opposed to you know the progressive Republican efforts during Reconstruction. It was something that everybody it was clearly effective. It resonated because you know a lot of these things are kind of you know. Uh, uh, happening at the same time and they're linked. And as I mentioned, people are beginning to grapple and misinterpret Darwin's account of natural selection in arguing that, you know, human beings are, there's a spectrum of, uh, of evolution. Some, some people are more evolved than other people. And, you know, can we give citizenship and the right to vote to people who are less evolved, who are actually closer to the gorilla than they are to human beings. So for example, Shailu in his, what, his first book about Western Africa actually has an image where he has the gorilla skeleton and a human skeleton. He says, look, they're very close. <laughs> you know, the the physio phys physiology of humans and apes are very, very similar. And of course, the, you know, they have, they'll, they'll look at African skulls, skulls of African people and say, huh, these skulls are smaller and they're misshapen and they're actually closer to the gorilla. And so all this nonsense, um, we look at it as nonsense, but you know, in the 1860s, 1870s, it was science. Um, and science has you know, enormous credibility. And so you know, the opponents of reconstruction could say that, hey, we have science on our side. You know, we're the ones who are actually dealing with facts, which they weren't, but you know, they, they could make that argument in, in a compelling way. Well, and kind of driving that point home about the Democrats kind of stump speeches, you quote someone in Kentucky, 
who says bondage had provided the necessary restraints against savageness. All that members of the quote, all that the Negro is above the gorilla he owes to slavery. Yeah. And I mean, that's just shockingly, just shockingly. Yeah, it was a very common argument that, you know, Africans in Africa were barely above the level of animals, but, you know, slavery by introducing African peoples to A, discipline, uh, B, work, and C, you know, the elements of Western civilization, including Christianity, had helped Africans to progress that slavery was a school, that slavery was a humane system, and that without the discipline of slavery, African Americans would devolve into their original, you know, natural African selves, and that they would be unleashed in the United States, and they would, there would be rapes, there would be murders, there would be just violence uh, and chaos as Africans devolved into their original natural, you know, savage natures. And so the idea that slavery humanized and civilized Africans was very widespread. In, in, before the Civil War, uh, you know, in the 1840s, 1850s, as, as white Southerners felt the need to defend their institution, which was increasingly under attack in the, the sort of English-speaking world, but also after, which said, uh oh, slavery's gone now, watch out. Because these African peoples, you know, the, you know, the, the African Americans are essentially Africans, and there's an African nature, and it's going to reemerge, and it's going to be bad. <laughs> and, the, and the thing that I was kind of, I know we can't make a direct parallel to today, but we're talking about mass media and mass culture at the time. I mean, these are major politicians running for office. These are people on lecture circuits, this is newspapers, and the, the mass media, right, is making sure. the point. So, I mean, when we think of, like, how these dominant, or how these threads came to be, it's all through the mass media, correct? Yeah, so we're talking about, the, you know, of course, there's no Facebook, no Twitter, no CNN, you know, all that. Um, but Americans, you know, you look at like going to the 1820s and Alexis de Tocqueville, you know, one of the things that he was struck by was that Americans were a newspaper reading people, um, that newspapers were inexpensive to produce. Um, and it's important to also uh, understand that newspapers plagiarized themselves shamelessly. That is, they reprinted articles from other newspapers. And this was accepted. This was accepted practice that you simply, you know, is and most, most newspapers were weekly. And you know, depending on the size of your town, there might not be a lot of news going on. So you, you you took interesting articles from other newspapers and you simply reprinted them. And they would all they, they'll say like if you know you have an article from the Cincinnati Enquirer, it'll say this originally appeared in the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Where we you know so they attribute where they're getting their stuff from, but they reprint these things. And so these accounts are widely shared and dispersed. And a lot of the things I, I found was that. You know, I'll, I would see an article and said, oh, I've already read this article. It appeared somewhere else. Um, and so, you know, Americans read newspapers. The Americans were extremely literate. And, you know, even if you weren't literate, if you were, a, you know, if you were at a, a restaurant or a bar or a, a tavern, somebody would be reading the newspaper aloud for other people to hear. So this is really how Americans were connected to the world um, and to each other by you know, the mass media of the day, which was the newspaper media. And I bring that up because you ran the article uh, with, a, I think, a, a damning indictment of Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind and how the ape narrative has, has the gorilla narrative has sunk into one of the most enduring story, love stories of American history, right? This Gone with the Wind. Sure. Yeah, so my point at the end was that this, this, this connection between African peoples, African Americans, and gorillas has, has legs, right? I mean, you see it in media. It doesn't die with reconstruction. It, it's, it's one that, you know, so Margaret Mitchell, you know, she talks about in that, you know, in Going with the Wind, for example, her account of the character Mammy is, you know, she's a good slave, right? I mean, she's, she's, she doesn't want to be free. 
she loves you know she she loves the you know the uh her family her white family uh and yet Margaret Mitchell says in that account that well you know she's she looks like a gorilla you know she's got that she's got that there's there's no you know the leopard can't change its stripes you know mammy's a great person but slavery made her into what she is a good person but you know she's got that gorilla ness in her and by the way you know the, if you look up you know if you google Michelle Obama and gorilla you're going to find some horrible stuff out there. So this is not gone by any means. And, you know, in the last six years, these, some people have felt empowered to, uh, to, to uh, mainstream or try to mainstream these ideas, which many of us probably thought were in the past. Um, but, you know, there are, it's not. <laughs> there, are, there, are all, there have always been these people. Sometimes they've been under rocks and sometimes they feel empowered to come out under the rocks. And, you know, and social media, I know this is a terrible cliche, so forgive me, but it, you know, it, it, by creating communities of people with like minds, uh, even if they're fringe ideas, it empowers people to say things that they otherwise might not say in public. But as I said, you know, you post something online and it's there forever. And uh, you can find these pretty shocking and upsetting images of, of Black people today. Uh, Serena Williams is, is another person who is, who racist Americans will liken to, uh, you know, gorillas and monkeys. It's, it's, it's still there. So it's not, it's not just, you know, not just gone with the wind uh, in the 19 teens and 20s. It is still there. And I think that's an important point, and one we can probably end on is that these these racist. When someone speaks of systemic racism and kind of the narrative of racism, this is what we're talking about, right? This kind of like comes directly out of slavery, and it's still with us today. And there's a direct through line. Yeah, you know, it, I mean, it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> it really, it really was not in in the long arc of history. Um, that these things, you know, are going to persist, and um, you know, uh, being uh, being a white guy, you know, I've been in situations where people make assumptions about me, and they kind of let their guard down and talk about things that they think. Of course, you're, I'm going to agree with it. You know, so they to say some pretty shocking racist stuff, and I'm like, you know, sometimes I'll say something, and sometimes, depending on the situation, I will not. But no, these these attitudes are very much alive, um, and they're more popular than we would like to think they are. Unfortunately, and you know, if we don't watch it, they, they they people who believe in these things will become more and more empowered, and think that they can mainstream these things. They're they're not that deep below the surface even today. I mean, in you know, in the eighteen sixties and seventies, obviously. White, white Americans felt no limits, no compunction about saying these things. There were no consequences for engaging in this outrageous sort of rhetoric. Today there are, but that doesn't mean they're not there. And that, that doesn't mean that some people feel empowered and they, ha and they have a platform or platforms for, you know, making some like memes, for example, that are very shocking and un-American, I would argue. Right. And I, I think that that's the, you know, one of the things that I'm always struck by, by is the idea that like, there's a certain people who want to get back to that being the dominant narrative, yeah. like it was in the 60s and 70s. And, you know, that's the, I think that's their goal, not, you know, when cancel culture and all that comes up, it's always like, well, I want to say this stuff without consequence, like we used to. Yeah, that's like, oh, I'm just asking questions. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just, what's wrong with asking questions? Which is bad faith. We really, know if that's a bad faith argument. You're not, you know, that, that's ridiculous. But no, there are people who will say, you know, we need to get back to the real America with real Americans in charge. And, you know, it's, it's not too hard to understand what they mean by who are real Americans and who aren't real Americans, right? Um, and so again, a lot of this stuff is you know, if you say something you're like, whoa, what did I say? What you know, I didn't say anything, but and he's like, Yes, you did. You know you did. 
you know what you said, you know what you meant, I know what you know, none of this gaslighting nonsense. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a lot of this, oh, I'm just, I'm just asking questions, you know, what's, maybe we shouldn't have birthright citizenship. I'm just asking questions, you know, it's, don't get offended, you know, that's no, don't cancel me. Um, so, you know, it, it takes a lot of patience to engage with that kind of nonsense. And sometimes it's just not worth it. <laughs> maybe even most of the time, it's not worth it. <laughs> Especially if they're not willing to engage in anything other than the, the shock. Of- oh, and they're not, they're, they're, they're not. I mean, nine times out of 10 or more, they're, 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 there's no good faith uh, willingness to actually engage here. This is all about gaslighting and shock and being, and, you know, making, you see, I'm, oh, you know, you, I'm being silenced. I'm a victim. Um, you know, certain ideas, you know, it's, it's just garbage. Right. And I mean, it's that, it gets back to that whole idea is, did the South lose the war? And they, they may have lost the, the battles, but they won the narrative in some regard. Yeah, I mean, the battles of the narrative are still going on. I mean, <clears throat> all you have to do is look on Amazon for biographies of Abraham Lincoln, and there's still a lot, you know, there's still plenty of fringe literature out there about how, you know, Lincoln was our worst president, and he, you know, he he, he was the foundation of big government, and he, you know, all this stuff. So those arguments are, there's no, there's, then there's nothing we can do about that. Those are going to persist. Even if it's on the fringe, it's going to be out there. And, you know, the way that our media is organized, and I don't have a problem with this, um, those people have a platform. Even if it's not a big one, it's there. <laughs>